Day 327 of Heart Dive 365. I'm your Bible study friend, Holly, and welcome to the Heart Dive Podcast. Welcome back to Heart Dive. We are jumping back into the books of Acts. After we covered the entire book of James, Kanoi took the lead on that one, and I hope you got a lot of golden nuggets out of that one. But we're going to continue to kind of bounce back and forth between Acts and some of the epistles. Now, remember that we're reading in chronological order. And so you may be asking, why did we just jump out of Acts? It's because what is happening over in Acts in the previous chapters, we then jump over to the book of James because remember, James is the leader of the Jerusalem church. And now we're going to jump back in, get some more context of what's happening, and then jump back over to the next epistle that was perhaps written around this time. So the book of Acts is kind of a synop of the beginning of the church. This is Luke's account story of how the church came to be. Now, if you're brand new around here, I hope that gave you a little snippet of what we're doing with the Heart Dive 365. But if you've been part of the Heart Dive family, thank you for being here. And you know what I'm going to ask? Hit the roll call button down below. Again, that helps the robots and the algorithm do their job. The more engagement that we have on our videos, the more that the robots then think, oh, this is good content. Let's push this out to other people. Um, We know that in the analytics that the browse features and suggested videos are the top two ways people are finding out. I would love to know, can you name someone or, you know, put a little heart emoji down below for someone who has personally invited you to Bible study? Those are the people who are doing the work, the hands and the feet of discipleship, the Great Commission, sharing God's word, Even if it's just via a text or you saw someone at church or perhaps at lunch at work and you're saying, hey, I found this Bible study. I'm getting so much value out of it. I think you will, too. Why don't you join me? Speaking of joining us, we will have lots of new things coming out over the next couple of weeks. Uh, We've been working with our person behind the scenes with the planners. Thank you, Sarah, for all the help that you've done there. And we have an ad event from the volunteers and zoom facilitators over at our facebook group so if you're not in the facebook group you can personally get to know a lot of these people who have contributed and provided blog posts that we're going to send out we'll have a pdf just like we did for our easter just like we did for our easter series so if you sign up you will get that i will send that out in the regular email that i send out daily and i'll have that link down below and So we really appreciate everyone who has signed up because guess what? We don't own YouTube, obviously, and we don't own the websites. You know what I mean? Like the platforms are the platforms are the bigger people. So if you're not on our email list, perhaps we ever get hacked, scammed, stolen out from underneath our own feet, we won't be able to contact you. So if you're not on the email list, which is a safeguard, you won't be able to find us if we perhaps lose contact to everything. We have to build from the ground back up. So I, it's kind of a safety measure as well that if YouTube, for whatever reason, all of a sudden doesn't think our content's worth it and just deletes our account for no reason, you're on our email list and that we still have access to and that we can still get in contact with you. All right, enough announcements. Kanoi and I are both battling little colds and before my nose starts to run again, let's prepare our hearts for the word of God today. Thank you, Heavenly Father, for this time. Thank you for your word, your word that can be trusted, your word that we can write on our hearts and know that we can use it as a guide and a framework for living righteously, but also we can find salvation, Lord, that it is by grace through faith that we have eternal life through your sacrifice. Thank you for everything that you've done for us. Thank you for pouring into these 12 disciples and even revealing yourself to Paul, giving him a God-made message, not a man-made message. Thank you for these revelations. Thank you, Lord. So help us empty ourselves of ourselves, of distractions, of transgressions, anything that keeps us from being able to hear your word clearly today, Lord. We ask you to come and show up in a mighty, mighty way, to reveal to us anything that we need to surrender, We need to let go of and give to you. 
We ask this in Jesus' name. We are reading from the English Standard Version from Crossway Publishing, and we are starting in the book of Acts, chapter 15. But some men came down from Judea and were teaching their brothers. Okay, the some men, we get a little bit of explanation on that lower in the chapter and also in Galatians, but they are saying that these are Judaizers. Now, Judaizers are people who are converted Jews. These are Jews who are believers and they're following the church and they're pushing in their own teachings on top of the message of salvation. So let's read a little bit more before we can get a better context. So, but some of the men came down from Judea and were teaching the brothers, unless you are circumcised according to the customs of Moses, you cannot be saved. And after Paul and Barnabas had no small decision and debate with them, Paul and Barnabas and some of the others were appointed to go up to Jerusalem to the apostles and the elders about this question. Now, remember, it says to go up to Jerusalem, even though they, this is an elevation thing. They were over in Antioch and these other places like Galatia, uh, which we will read about in Galatians. And they're saying, okay, it's time to go have a council, wise council. So in verse three, so being sent on their way by the church, they passed through both um, Phoenicia and Samaria, describing in detail the conversion of the Gentiles. Very important. We're focusing on the conversion of the Gentiles and brought great joy to all the brothers. When they came to Jerusalem, they were welcomed by the church and the apostles and the elders, and they declared all that God had done with them. But some believers who belonged to the party of the Pharisees, all right, party of the Pharisees, that's important to know as well. So these men who were teaching belonged to the party of the Pharisees, rose up and said, it is necessary. Anytime someone adds the word, it is necessary to the gospel of salvation, you should have a red flag. All right. What are your red flags that show up when someone says, oh, I'm a Christian. I have to do blah, blah, blah. I have to. It's necessary. You must do red flag, red flag. OK, so they're saying these Pharisees, it is necessary to circumcise them. It is necessary to circumcise them and to order them to keep the law of Moses. So the context here is that the church is growing, it's expounding, it's going out into the world. We've already had some of Paul's missionary journeys, and I would recommend getting a map on his missionary journey so you know what little churches have sprouted up as he keeps going out into the world, specifically to the nations, right, to the Gentiles. So now they're being followed by this group of people. The word Judaizer is... um not really in the Bible, but there is a verb to Judaize, which is to push the Jewish lifestyle onto people. And they are following the church and adding to the gospel. They're adding to and saying, you must do this to be saved and you must do this to be saved. And there is an argument. Paul and Barnabas have been upset about this. They've come to seek wise counsel with the apostles at the church in Jerusalem. And this is very important that we take heed and put this into our own practices that when we come up against opposition or maybe doctrinal issues, that we have some mentors or people we can go to. Shoot, we get a whole bunch of emails and comments down below that challenge us. And thank goodness that we have the time to go and research things. But you don't always have to ask questions down below, which you can. Do you have a mentor? Do you have a tutor? Do you have a church group, Bible study group that you can go and dive into these and seek wise counsel? All right, so let's dive deeper into this counsel. In verse six, it says, the apostles and the elders were gathered together to consider this matter. And after there had been much debate, and this word in Greek is zetizisos or something like that, it's right here. So y'all can go Google it. But here, this is not a foolishness. This is, we need to have a wise questioning and inquiry into this issue because this is doctrinal. This is not folly and it's not foolish. So there had, they had been much debate. Peter stood up and said to them, brothers, you know that in the early days, God made a choice among you that by my mouth, the Gentiles should hear the word of the gospel and believe. 
He's speaking of the revelation that he had from the Lord that the Gentiles were on the same plain field as Jews. They were not less than. And God, who knows the heart, bore witness to them by giving them the Holy Spirit, just as he did to us. Now, most Jews would probably reverse that statement and say, we were given the Holy Spirit and they were given it just like us. So a lot of the Jewish people still hung to their covenant promise. All right. They still have that, that covenant promise that we had God first. He is ours first. You should actually become a Jew before you can have salvation. And then you can accept our Messiah, our Jewish Messiah. And just the way that Peter worded this statement, He's flipping it. He's flipping the script and saying, they got the Holy Spirit just like we did. He's honoring the Gentiles and saying that they're worthy of the Holy Spirit and that they have salvation through Christ by faith. So in verse nine, he continues that statement and he made no distinction between us and them having cleansed their hearts by faith. Now, therefore, why are you putting God to the test by placing a yoke on the neck of the disciples that neither our fathers nor we have been able to bear? If you really want to dive into just this chapter and actually how it leads into the next couple of days content, which is the book of Galatians, just sit on this verse. Just sit here. What he just said is paramount for the salvation and the sanctification and justification of our salvation, okay? I know I said a lot of big words there, right? Our justification for our salvation is by grace through faith alone. Do not add to it by throwing a heavy yoke on their neck because it's not needed. It's not. And that's what he's saying right here. We couldn't keep to the law the legalism, the rules, the rituals. Our fathers couldn't keep to it. Read the whole Old Testament, right? We just did it. They couldn't keep to the law. Then why burden them with that heavy yoke that not even we could bear? And he continues in verse 11, but we believe that we will be saved through the grace of the Lord Jesus, just as they will. And you can have a cross reference here to over Ephesians chapter two, verses eight and Galatians two sixteen. This is the message of grace. It is salvation through grace. That's all. So in 12 verse 12, and all the assembly fell silent and they listened to Barnabas and Paul as they related what signs and wonders God had done through them among the Gentiles. After they finished speaking, James replied, James being the leader of the church here, Brothers, listen to me. Simeon, now he's talking about Peter, and he's using his Jewish name because he's with a Jewish crowd. Simeon has related how God first visited the Gentiles to take from them a people for his name. And with this, the words of the prophets agree, just as it is written. All right, he's quoting Amos chapter 9, verses 11 through 12 here. But what is of note is, is that he's quoting it from the Septuagint. And so therefore there are some discrepancies between the Aramaic Old Testament Amos writings and then what he is actually quoting here. And if you want to do a deep dive into how it's interpreted, there are different views because of the words and phrases he's using here. And I believe there's um, an amillennial view, a premillennial view, and a premillennialism view view. So we don't really dive deep into theologies and ideologies of different viewpoints. We read word by word, verse by verse, and we allow the Holy Spirit to be our guide and teacher. And so, yes, those things are important to know, but that's not at the level we need to really dive into. But I wanted to bring it to your attention in case you wanted to dive deeper into what James is quoting and why he is quoting it. All right back to reading. So he says in verse 16, after this, I will return and I will rebuild the tent of David that has fallen. So is the tent, the tabernacle? Is it the temple? Is it the church? Is it the spiritual church, the physical church? 
I will rebuild its ruins and I will restore it, that the remnant of mankind, here this could also say all nations, Gentiles, but he's using mankind, all inclusive, so that the remnant of mankind may seek the Lord and all the Gentiles who are called by my name. So here the Gentiles are saying called by his name or the believers, says the Lord who makes these things known from of old. Here he is implying from my interpretation that Jesus came and he is the prophecy fulfilled in this statement in Amos. So in 19, therefore my judgment, this is James, therefore my judgment is that we should not trouble or annoy those of the Gentiles who turn to God, but should write to them to abstain from the things polluted by idols and from sexual immorality and from what has been strangled and from blood. For from ancient generations, Moses has had in every city those who proclaim him, for he is read every Sabbath in the synagogues. If you notice, he doesn't say abstain from these to keep your salvation or to earn your salvation. He's saying, right, he says to just abstain from them. And you get an, uh, another cross reference here at the very bottom when he writes his letter. But he clearly does not say these things are necessary for salvation. This whole chapter is about doctrinal differences on salvation. He's not adding to salvation. He's saying, these are good things to do if you're a Gentile who's hanging out with Jews. Verse 22, then it seemed good to the apostles and the elders with the whole church to choose men from among them and send them to Antioch with Paul and Barnabas, sending out an entire group of people, not just two people, so they can speak truth into this letter. They sent Judas called Bersabbas and Silas, leading men among the brothers, with the following letter. The brothers, both the apostles and the elders, to the brothers who are of the Gentiles in Antioch and Syria and Sicilia, greetings. Since we have heard that some persons have gone out from us and troubled you with words, unsettling your minds, although we gave them no instructions, they had no authority to do this, it has seemed good to us, having come to one accord, So they have made an agreement upon this issue to choose men and send them to you with our beloved Barnabas and Paul, men who have risked their lives for the name of our Jesus, uh, the name of our Lord, Jesus Christ. We have therefore sent Judas and Silas, who themselves will tell you the same things by word of mouth. For it has seemed good to the Holy Spirit and to us to lay on you no greater burden than these requirements, that you abstain from what has been sacrificed to idols and from blood and from what has been strangled and from sexual immorality. If you keep yourselves from these, you will do well. So here he doesn't say, if you keep yourself from these, you will keep your salvation or you will earn your salvation or you will have salvation. He did not say that. That is omitted here. Do not add to. He's saying you will do well. This is a conversation in sanctification. He is saying that if you are a Gentile who didn't grow up a Jew and in that culture with these practices, these are things that you might want to observe now, especially in the audience of Jewish fellowship these are and and said here these are more ceremonial matters so when you come to the table with a jewish man who now believes in the way these are things that you can do at the table and it's not going to you know put them off and these aren't bad things to do but you can read more about this when we get to first corinthians but i just the biggest thing that we can take away is that they did not say these things were necessary for salvation so in verse 30 So when they were sent off, they went down to Antioch and having gathered the congregation together, they delivered the letter. And when they had read it, they rejoiced because of its encouragement. And Judas and Silas, who were themselves prophets, encouraged and strengthened the brothers with many words. And after they had spent some time, they were sent off in peace by the brothers to those who had sent them. But Paul and Barnabas remain in Antioch, teaching and preaching the word of the Lord with many others also. 
The more that the yoke of the law is placed on their shoulders, the more of a burden it is for the grace of God to lay on them. Like, okay, I've got the grace, but also I got to do this and this and this. And so now with this letter, they can rise up. They're encouraged. They have joy in their hearts again because the yoke of the law was a heavy burden and it was annoying and troubling. And now they're encouraged and they can move forward and rejoice. So in verse 36, and after some days, Paul said to Barnabas, let us return and visit the brothers in every city where we proclaim the word of the Lord and see how they are. He is having very good discernment here saying, hmm, if Antioch is having a problem with these issues, maybe we should go visit all the other churches and check in on them as well to make sure things are still kosher and the gospel still being shared succinctly and concisely and not being added to not a bad idea, right? So that's what he has in his spirit. Now Barnabas wanting to take with them John called Mark, but Paul thought best not to take with him one who had withdrawn from them in Pamphylia and had not gone with them to the work. So here it is a clear, clear reason why he said, okay, I do not want this young man to come with us. Now we don't really know why the scholars and commentators believe perhaps he was young and experienced and he just kind of like you know got cold feet and didn't go with them on a mission didn't fulfill you know his word that he would be with them and paul say no he's immature this is not a mission for him and barnabas remember he's the one they call encouragement right he's an encourager he's the man that sees a second chance in everyone He's the one that's like, no, 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 I want this John Mark to come with us. I see greatness in him. I see this opportunity that can be molded into a minister for the gospel. But, and there arose a sharp disagreement so that they separated from each other. Barnabas took Mark with him and sailed away to Cyprus, but Paul chose Silas and departed, having been commended by the brothers to the grace of the Lord. And he went through Syria and Cilicia and strengthening the churches. Okay, to wrap up chapter 15, what we want to see here is that there's two disagreements happening. One is a disagreement or difference in doctrine. And those issues need to be resolved. We cannot have discord and doctrine, especially essential and non-essential. Now I'm going to drop a link down below to another person's ministry. It's called Reasoning Through the Bible. And they have a little PDF on essential and non-essential doctrines, right? Essential, these are things that have to do with salvation issues. What is mandatory versus those that are secondary. You do not need these things for your salvation, but they're good things to do for sanctification. Okay. And so that is a, a side PDF that we're going to drop down below. Now, the second disagreement we have here in uh, Acts is a disagreement of opinions. They happen. We're all different. We can all have different views. I can tell you right now that a lot of different, you know, differences in opinions had led me, has led me to this ministry with Kanoi. How many times I've wanted to do this thing in the church or do this thing with the women or do this thing as a job somewhere else. Yet there's been differences of opinions of like, no, 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 we're going to go this direction. And no, 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 I'm going to go this direction or I'm going to go that direction. And so I just kept putting one foot in front of the other. I stayed in step with the spirit. I stayed in step with the obedience of God. And I just kept sanctifying myself, separating myself, right? Sanctification means to set apart. That means the closer I get to God, the farther away I get from the world. That's what I've been doing. And so here, disagreements happen. They're not condemned. They're not rebuked. I think it's in the Bible for a reason. It's for us to see that good things can come from a closed door. Barnabas is now going to go and preach to a completely different area. And he's being sent two by two, right? With John Mark. Paul is now going to go to a different area with Silas. Now we have four four missionaries going out, spreading the word of God and covering more territory. It's an exponential growth. Also, now you are able to train up other people. We can have different visions, different assignments, differences in opinions. But you know what one thing they did agree upon? Doctrine. They both agreed that circumcision was not needed, just like the law of Moses was not needed for salvation. So heart check, 
How can differences in opinions and interpersonal conflicts be used to further the kingdom of God? And on the other hand, how can we discern when disagreements, especially over doctrinal versus personal opinions, risk causing division instead of unity in the body, in the body of Christ? Acts chapter 16. Paul came also to Derby and to Lystra, dis, and to Lystra. A disciple was there named Timothy, the son of a Jewish woman who was a believer, but his father was a Greek. Now, what's interesting here, the son of a Jewish woman is very important because that is how the Jewish lineage is considered. That's how they authenticate or recognize someone as being a Jew is through their mother's line, not their father's. So as uh, a son of a Jewish woman, he should have been practicing Jewish culture and practices but then but she was a believer so now she's following the way but his father was a greek so clearly his father didn't care if there were practices being followed as a jew so in verse 2 he was well spoken of by the brothers at lystra in econium now this is important because that means that he already had a reputation of being a man of god and a believer for jesus christ Paul wanted Timothy to accompany him and he took him and circumcised him because of the Jews who were in those places for they all knew that his father was a Greek. That's why I explained so much above. So you understood the reasoning behind the circumcision for Timothy. As they went on their way through the cities, they delivered to them for observance the decisions that had been reached by the apostles and elders who were in Jerusalem. So the churches were strengthened in the faith and they increased in numbers daily. The fruitfulness and effective faith is what caused the ability to duplicate the faith. And I think that's beautiful. So what just happened here? Paul is uh, traveling through and the speculation here is that Timothy was very young. And we know this later when we read those epistles, first and second Timothy, right? And they say perhaps he was 15. He was that young. So here he is at 15 years old. Clearly his father was not following Jewish traditions because he's not a Jew, but the mother was, but she was probably honoring her husband and didn't do things. So why was he circumcised? It was definitely not for salvation. It was because in him being a Jew by ethnicity, that he would not be able to reach other Jewish people if he didn't have um, the covenant, right, of the circumcision. And it would seem like he's rejecting the covenant of God by not being circumcised. And so it could mess up his testimony as a Jewish man to Jewish, to other Jewish people. So that's the only reason. Later on, Paul even actually finds this to be erroneous. Those, that's in the Bible, to continue to do this practice because it's not needed for salvation. And they really need to let go of this legalistic view that you have to, it's necessary to do. Verse six, and they went through the region of Pergria and Galatia and having been forbidden by the Holy Spirit to speak the word in Asia. And when they had come up to Messiah, they attempted to go into Bethania, but the spirit of Jesus did not allow them. I know I'm emphasizing the not because I want you to clearly see the Holy Spirit is closing these doors. So passing by Mycia, they went down to Troas and a vision appeared to Paul in the night. A man of Macedonia was standing there urging him and saying, come over to Macedonia and help us. And when Paul had seen the vision immediately, we sought to go on into Macedonia, concluding the God that God had called us to preach the gospel to them. I know I was emphasizing a lot there. So sometimes the Holy Spirit closes the door. Yes, it's, it's the Holy Spirit. Sometimes it can be the devil. A lot of times we give him way, way too much credit, especially when we're moving and we're not quite sure if we're in the spirit or in our own will. And so here they're saying perhaps they knew they were moving in the spirit because um, he's with Silas, right? He's traveling with Silas and Timothy. So Paul, Silas, Timothy, Silas was known to be a prophet. And perhaps he had a vision from the Lord and he'd be like, no, 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 I, I feel in my spirit. The Lord is saying, no, that don't go that way. Or perhaps Paul was given one as well, but they definitely like things happen, circumstances, and they couldn't go into Asia. Not yet. Also, just because the door is closed doesn't mean you won't go there eventually because he eventually does go into these other areas. So I've always been told these could be God's divine appointments 
or the devil's deceptive opportunities. Sometimes something real shiny and beautiful and it's like it's going to help you and grow you. You think that's from the Lord because clearly he wants blessings and favor on your life, you know, and we see that a lot. And I'm sorry, but certain ministries or tele evangelists that are like, you want blessings and favor and manifestation in your life. And they'll, you know, portray the Holy Spirit only giving blessings in a certain kind of way. And so personal experience, a lot of times when something really shiny shows up in my life at a time where I'm also doing really good work from the Lord, I'll have to evaluate, okay, what are the great things? Is it going to be flesh favor and blessings that will come? Or will it be spiritual flavor and blessings? Flavor, <laughs> favor. And for me, it's always been, okay, this shiny thing over here actually is not going to pour into my spirit. It's not going to fill my cup up. I'm pretty sure that's not from the Lord. This over here though, this is going to be harder. I'm probably not going to get as much money. I'm probably not going to get as much fame or recognition, but I clearly know it's from the Lord because my cup will be overflowing. And yeah, that's heart dive. I actually turned down a job at a church because heart dive was at this place where I could potentially grow with Kanoi in a certain type of way. And she told me, she's like, no, 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 Holly, you can go take the job. You can go do that. You can, I'm like, no, no, no. I really feel in my spirit. This is where I'm supposed to be. And she's like, okay, if the spirit is saying, be here, I want you here. Let's do this. And we went all in after that because I was giving not one, but multiple opportunities to walk away and go do something else. But I can't tell you the amount of fruit, peace, tranquility, joy, that I have in my life now, but I can tell you right now that that closed door, though it was a deceptive opportunity, was not the divine God appointment. All that to say, heart check. <laughs> Are you going to the Lord when you're presented opportunities so you can, to discern if it's a God divine op appointment or if it's a scheme of a deceptive opportunity from the evil one. Now, a uh, second note is that we went from a they statement to a we statement. So here, the Macedonian man, the consensus here is that Luke is placing himself now into the story. This is where he shows up. He's the Macedonian man. And so it goes into the we passages. So verse 11, so setting sail from Trios, we made a direct voyage to Samothrace and following in the following day to Neapolis and from there to Philippi a leading city of the district of Macedonia in a Roman colony. We remained in the city some days. Now, the fact that it's a Roman colony is, is very important, as we'll see. And on the Sabbath day, we went outside the gate to the riverside where we supposed there was a place of prayer and we sat down and spoke to the women who had come together. So why they're saying supposed there was a place of prayer, that means that perhaps there was no synagogue in the area because you had to have at a minimum 10 men to have a synagogue. So this big Roman colony didn't even have enough Jewish men for a synagogue. So they went to a place of prayer and found women. Oh, I love it. I love that women are sprinkled all throughout Luke's books. All right. So in verse 14, one who heard us was a woman named Lydia from the city of Thyatira, a seller of purple goods who was a worshiper of God. The Lord opened her heart. He gave credit to the Lord, not him. The Lord opened her heart to pay attention to what was said by Paul. And after she was baptized in her household as well, she urged us saying, if you have judged me to be faithful to the Lord, come to my house and stay. And she prevailed upon us. Lydia, beautiful, her beautiful heart, Lydia. So Lydia, the name perhaps means that she is a freed slave or a servant. It also means that she's of that Gentile descent, but she was a converted Jew. So she was a Jewish proselyte. So she came to know the Jewish faith, but hearing Paul's message, she was then, she believed in Jesus Christ. She being a seller of purple cloth means that there was a very good trade. So she had money and head of household. So perhaps she was unmarried or widowed or divorced. So she was in charge of all these things. And it says they prevailed. Um, she prevailed over them. That means that she understood the Jewish culture going on here. As a woman, inviting them to her house was weird. 
and she wasn't married so that was weird too but Paul you will see kind of bucks up against that he knows that he is going to bring a message to the Gentiles even though he is a Jew ethnicity wise and so he's changing things he is doing that upside down kingdom approach to things just like Jesus and they went to her house get this though her hospitality created a standard in a sense and it was copied this place became a place for the church and the hospitality was known for being a refuge for traveling missionaries for the church so her hospitality and using what she had is really what we need to take from this so many believers are like when i'm ready when i get there i'll do this i'll do that she was just converted and got baptized. And she goes, I got a house. I got money. Y'all come on over to my house. I will feed you and you have somewhere to lay down. So heart check. Are you listening to the nudges of the Holy Spirit even when one door closes and another opens? And how can you, like Lydia, use what you have, your resources, your time or skills right now to further your own sanctification in the faith of others without waiting for the perfect moment? And is there something the Spirit is leading you to do today? And so now in this new area in Europe, this ministry, what happens? As we were going to the place of prayer, we were met by a slave girl who had a spirit of divination and brought her own owners much gained by fortune telling. She followed Paul and us crying out, these men are servants of the most high God who proclaim to you the way of salvation. That's not a bad statement, right? But in this, she kept doing for many days. Paul, having become greatly annoyed, turned and said to the spirit, I command you in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. And it came out of that very hour. And it came out that very hour. But when her owner saw that their hope of gain was gone, and they seized Paul and Silas and dragged them into the marketplace before the rulers. And when they had brought them to the magistrates, they said, these men are Jews. You're using the anti-Jewish sentiment here because there was one. These men are Jews and they are disturbing our city. Didn't tell the truth. Didn't mention anything about the money. They advocate customs that are not lawful for us as Romans to accept or practice. Okay, so they're distinguishing that they're Jews and not Romans here, right? And advocating that they're doing things that are not normal, right? So the crowd joined in attacking them and the magistrates tore the garments off them and gave orders to beat them with rods. No court here, no trial. They were beaten on hearsay. And when they had inflicted many blows upon them, they threw them into prison, ordering the jailer to keep them safely. Having received this order, order he put them into the inner prison and fastened their feet in the stocks. So considering that they were beat, considering they didn't have a trial, considering that they said, keep them safe, he put them in the inner sanctum where they couldn't get out, put their locks in on their feet. This guard is under the impression they're going to be executed. So continuing about midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God. Could you do that? Could you be persecuted, beaten for the faith, lied about, named drug through the mud? You're sitting in prison. You probably think you're going to be executed or you're, you know, no, with no indication that you're going to get out and praise God. Can you praise God? in the midst of your darkest moment. And so while they're praising God and the prisoners were listening to them and suddenly there was a great earthquake so that the foundations of the prison were shaken and immediately all the doors were opened and everyone's bonds were unfastened. When the jailer woke and saw that the prison doors were open, he drew his sword and was about to kill himself, supposing that the prisoners had escaped. But Paul cried with a loud voice, do not harm yourself. For we are all here. And the jailer called for lights and rushed in, and trembling with fear, he fell down before Paul and Silas. Then he brought them out and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? And they said, Believe in the Lord Jesus, and you will be saved, you and your household. And they spoke the word of the Lord to him and all who were in his house. And he took them to that same hour of the night and washed their wounds. And he was baptized at once, he and all his family. Then he brought them up into his house and set food before them. And he rejoiced along with his entire household that he had believed in God. But when it was day, the magistrate sent the police saying, let those men go. And the jailer reported those, these words to Paul saying, the magistrates have sent to let you go. Therefore, come out now and go in peace. But Paul said to them, 
they have beaten us publicly, uncondemned men who are Roman citizens and have thrown us into prison. And do they now throw us out secretly? No. Let them come themselves and take us out. Okay, a lot to unpack here, right? One, all the stuff that happened to them just because they were proclaiming the word of God and they took the money out of some men's hands. So clearly the demons, the enemy is still at work. And even though they might be saying the truth because yeah, they believe in Jesus, they believe in the message, but they're all about messing it up. And so they can be claiming good things, but it doesn't mean it's going to be beneficial to the word of God. Because sometimes we don't need to yell on a street corner, right? Sometimes you just need to hold someone's hand and just be there with them in silence. And so if someone's yelling over my shoulder, oh, Jesus Christ, salvation, that ain't going to reach some people. So he's like, hush, we don't need that. And they got all, all upset and they got mad, sent him to jail. And yet in the prison, in the darkest hour, while they were beaten, probably sore, bruised, broken bones, they praise God. And isn't that just like God, that in your darkest hour, and you choose to obey him, he'll show up in a mighty way. They were able to lead this soldier and his entire household to the faith. Paul here is not condemning the magistrates for his own pride. No, 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 not after all that. He is doing this for the people once again. All of those who were listening in the prison, all of those who saw them get beat in the marketplace, for Lydia, who just gave her heart and her home to the ministry. He needs them to know that they can stand up boldly and speak truth. Sometimes you will be persecuted, but he needed them to know that with this new faith, yes, persecution will come, but they also, he needed to quench some fear here. And so in verse 38, the police reported these words to the magistrates and they were afraid when they heard that they were Roman citizens. Now remember it says they, they were Roman citizens. Another closed door, right? In the sense that if Paul had been there with Barnabas, who was a Jew Jew, not a Roman citizen, he couldn't have made this claim. But now he can. He can make this claim because he's with Silas and Luke and Timothy, who are Roman citizens. It makes it easier to give that message to the Gentiles. So they came and apologized to them and they took them out and asked them to leave the city. So they went out of the prison and visited Lydia. And when they had seen the brothers, they encouraged them and departed. And so for our deep dive questions, why is it important to guard against adding to the gospel? And how can we recognize when we might be falling into legalism? When faced with disagreements, how can we ensure we seek godly wisdom and counsel rather than letting personal preferences dominate? How can we trust that even in disagreements, God can still work through us to further his kingdom? And have you experienced this in your own life? What gifts, resources, or opportunities do you have right now that you could use to serve God, even if you don't feel ready? How can we cultivate a heart of praise, even in our darkest moments? How does this reveal? What does this reveal about the impact of our worship on others? How can we balance humility and boldness when we face unjust treatment for our faith? How can new believers discern the difference between genuine teaching and those who might lead them astray? What steps can we take to stay grounded in Christ? Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for the gift of salvation through Jesus Christ. We acknowledge that He alone is enough. Nothing we can do or add will ever be greater than the sacrifice you have already given. Thank you for the grace that sets us free. Call us to a life of faith. Lord, we pray for new believers today. This walk is not easy and the world is full of distractions, false teachings and moments of discouragement. Strengthen them to stand firm in the truth of your gospel. Remind them that sanctification is a journey, not perfection from the start. And encourage us all to use what we have now to glorify you. We ask for hearts like Lydia's, open to your call, eager to serve. May we be bold in our faith like Paul and Silas, singing your praises even in our darkest trials, knowing that you are always working for good. 
Help us to trust that even in disagreements or challenges, you are moving to further your kingdom. Protect us, Lord. Oh, Lord, protect us from false prophets and lead us with the wisdom of your Holy Spirit. May we grow in discernment, humility, and boldness as we live out your word. Thank you, Heavenly Father, for the unshakable hope we have in Jesus Christ. We love you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Heaven and salvation is a divine gift that is given to us by grace. None of us deserve it. In fact, the Bible says that the wages of sin is death, and every single one of us have fallen short, and then we desperately need someone to pay that price. And Jesus did it. He didn't do it because we are righteous on our own merit. He did it because he loves us and he wants to spend eternity with us. But it won't happen if we don't receive him before we leave this earth as Lord and Savior. Hell is a very real thing and there is no second chance after we take our last breath here. So I want to be able to give someone the opportunity today who is saying, I'm ready. I've never given my life to Christ. I don't know where I'm going to end up after I die. But I don't want to live another day without knowing beyond a shadow of a doubt where I am going to end up. I see now that this is real and I want to believe. So if that is you, we're going to say a prayer and I'm going to put the words on the screen so that you can say them audibly with your mouth because the Bible says that when you believe and confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and that he died and rose again, then you will be saved. So we're going to say this prayer together. Believe it in your heart, speak it with your mouth, and know that this is indeed the day of your salvation. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for Jesus. Jesus, thank you for dying for me. I believe that you came, you died, and you rose again. I confess my sins to you today, and I turn from them, and I now live my life for you. I know that I am forgiven of all my sins, so I receive you now, as Lord and Savior, and I belong to you, Jesus. I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.